Welcome to today's New England Hymns webinar, Using Telehealth to Bridge the Digital Divide and Provide Health Equity, presented by Donna McHale, Senior Director at Huron Consulting, and Diana Urani, COO and Senior Vice President at the Massachusetts League of Community Health Centers. All lines have been muted upon entry today. Please send all your questions via the Q&A feature, and we will answer them at the end of today's session. Donna is a high-performing senior director of the healthcare practice at Huron Consulting with over 36 years of direct experience. Her expertise are in managing large, challenging, complex projects and change initiatives. She has proven ability to create and grow organizational initiatives into successful enterprises by efficiently translating healthcare market needs and performance goals into actionable programs and solutions. Joining Donna today is Diana. She was previously the COO at Healthcare for the Homeless in Houston, an FQHC affiliated with Baylor College of Medicine. Diana has a bachelor's degree from Boston University and an MBA from New York University. Her prior work roles include business improvement analyst at the Government Accountability Office, adjunct professor at Boston University, internal consultant at the Empire Blue Cross Blue Shield, and manager of several private medical practices. Please join me in welcoming Donna and Diana today. Well, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We're so excited to talk to you about um, our wonderful topic of bridging digital, uh, the digital divide and uh, health equity. So Diana and I are gonna take some time with you and talk about telehealth across the care continuum and then the consumerism that's going on, which is really pushing some of their priorities. And then access barriers, the digital divide and digital literacy. And then Diana's gonna take over and tell us more about her amazing organization and what they're doing to bridge a lot of these gaps, especially around health equity and the social determinants of health. And then um, a consortium that they developed, the FQHC Telehealth Consortium. And then we'll have some time at the end for some questions and answers. So um, a couple of the object objectives that we have is, you know, we want to help you understand how you can use telehealth to drive patient access and equity. So that's um, going to be an important thing that we talk about. And then how you can address digital literacy and access in some of the underserved communities um, that we're all um, are uh, facing so that um, they can understand the digital tools that are available and how they can use that to help them. And then gather some knowledge about how you can achieve health equity uh, with telehealth and how you can sustain it because that's an area that a lot of our clients, um, as they get telehealth up, now they're interested to make sure that they can sustain it. And then you're gonna hear from Diana, um, all the amazing work that they've done around policy and advocacy for these topics. We just talked about how you can ask questions. So you can send them in the chat bo box or you can raise your hand. So let's talk a little bit about telehealth across the care continuum. You know, when we talk about telehealth, we really want to address the care continuum because it really does span um, the entire uh, uh, continuum of care for patients. And as we saw with COVID, a lot of telehealth started in the ambulatory care area. So you saw it around um, behavioral health, primary care encounters. And what we're seeing now is that organizations are saying, okay, we have our telehealth platform. And now what else can we do with it? Because there's a lot of other areas that we take care of patients with. And so they're looking more into the ambulatory setting to see what other parts of the ambulatory can we do. So a lot around specialty services and specialty consults, and then taking things post-op. So where can we take it, you know, uh, into the home? And then in acute care. So we see a lot of organizations, many of them had a telestroke up already pre-COVID, but since COVID and since people are, um, uh, stabilizing and what their telehealth platform is. They're looking to take it into the ICU and NICU areas and then provider to provider consults. So what else can they do there? 
And then we even have some organizations that are um, looking to see what they can do on the ambulance. So how can they have that early intervention by putting telehealth on the ambulance? And then focusing on post-acute. So what we're seeing here is around some of the topics we're gonna to talk about, the chronic disease management or population health. So how can you continue the patient's care once they leave the facility, or how can you keep them out of the facility by helping them manage their care and um, the transitional care management. So how, as the patient moves from one transition to the next, how can you, you use telehealth there? You know, it's been an interesting time and I call it the age of consumerism because what we're finding is very interesting in that patients are really acting as consumers now and they're using technology more than they ever have before to get information to make their healthcare um, decisions and preferences known. So, you know, what are they looking for? What are these consumers looking for? Well, they really want to be engaged so that they can manage their own health. And so what does that look like for a consumer? They have the mobile apps, um, their wearables, and they're using um, patient portals. And it's really kind of funny because it's not any more just one interaction at one point in time. It's really about gaining loyalty uh, for these consumers. They also wanna have greater uh, convenience and access. So they wanna be able to uh, provide anything online. It's really like, give me an app. There has to be uh, an app to be able to do this so I can do it online and very quickly from scheduling to looking up results uh, of any kind of a test that they have. And then they want to be armed with the information to make decisions. So this is an a, um, a area that we're seeing more organizations put focus on because consumers want information that they can trust. And then they wanna know that the data that they have is quality data. And on the reverse side, they wanna make sure that the data you receive about them is gonna be held confidential. So they wanna make sure that your security is set and that the information you have about them is gonna be secure and confidential. And then they want um, excellent customer service. So this is, um, again, another area where they're looking at quality visits. So because there are so many organizations like Walmart, CVS, Apple, Google, Microsoft, that are now starting to provide telehealth visits, consumers are saying, how can I tell what a quality visit is from some of those non-traditional healthcare organizations to a healthcare organization? So what's the quality difference? So a lot of organizations now are looking at how they can hone in on that and help their consumers and patients understand what's different about them. And then the consumers want to personalize their care. So whether it's the predictive analytics that they're looking for or genomics. So they're looking at um, you know, what they can do to make the care personal to them. Um, Roy Rosen, the chief in innovation officer at, at Penn Medicine had a great quote that I'd like to share with you. And he said, you really have to understand what the patients are worried about, what they're looking at, what they're looking for, what their fears are, and what they're trying to do. Because if you don't engage with them that way, then you know it doesn't matter what technology we're using. So what are some of the ways that you can engage consumers uh, in your healthcare? Organizations are doing many different things. What we're seeing a big rise in is, is something that's called the digital front door, where it's the outreach to let consumers know who you are and what you're doing and what you're all about. So that outreach to them, it's um, how you contact with them, how you set up your contact center so that they understand what's going on. And then the languages so that you have uh, your outreach available in multiple languages that serve your communities. And, and then what platforms do you have? So uh, what kind of a patient portal do you have? Is it being uh, widely used? And then are you pushing notifications to your consumers? Um, are you sending them text reminders about um, appointments? And then with telehealth, we already talked about a couple of things, 
But the other thing is um, also around remote patient monitoring. So patients are more engaged and they really wanna be able to take their own care in their hands. And so what can you provide them at home to help them manage their care? We've talked about the biometrics and the wearables that they're looking for, as well as the personalized medicine that they're looking for. And yet they still would like some in-person interactions because I think we all realize that during COVID, we were so grateful to have telehealth to be able to still take care of our patients and uh, the consumers, but some things still um, are better, better performed in, in person versus uh, telehealth. So um, looking to make sure that you provide the consumers with the information about that as well as starting to move, the trend is starting to move towards providing hospitals at home. So lots of different ways that you can engage with your consumer um, to help them know about who you are, to engage them, and then keep them loyal to you. One of the biggest issues, and I don't think that this will be a surprise to anyone on our call today, is um, around access. There are so many different barriers there. And even though a lot of great things happened last year during COVID with, um, for example, HRSA providing an $8 million grant um, for the telehealth broadband pilot, we still have a long way to go. You know, as you can see, you know, 42 million people still lack access to broadband. And it's interesting to note that Medicare patients, about 41% of them lack access to either a computer with high-speed internet or um, the devices that they need. But what's also very, very exciting is that while SpaceX was just recently traveling into space, they also started um, beta testing and launching satellites to see how they can provide internet access through the satellites. So that's some really great technology uh, coming our way. So we're excited about that. And why is this all so important? It's also important because once we can provide reliable connection for our consumers and our patient, it gives them opportunities to have um, better jobs, better educational resources, and um, really to be very competitive for the economies in some of the rural communities. So again, some of the barriers that are um, causing the digital divide and, and with digital divide, you know, a lot of it is around the access. So it's, you know, who has access and who doesn't to create that digital divide. So it was interesting that um, uh, one provider at Daily Organized um, Physicians said that about 40% of their Medicaid patients were virtually fluent with telemedicine. And I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about that in a minute, the digital literacy, because that's the other piece that we're finding is that patients and consumers don't understand all the information and data that we're pushing to them. So their digital, you know, the digital literacy, we have to help them with. And there's still, there's still many areas, there's older um, Americans or rural communities and different uh, populations that are vulnerable that are still disadvantaged by this digital divide. So I find it also um, uh, very interesting that 52% uh, of the Americans are relatively hesitant regarding um, new technologies and skills. So even though we may have all of this out there, they find it difficult to know if the information's reliable and it's hard for them to navigate the technology. So as organizations are starting to um, build up their telehealth um, platforms and programs, it's important and that we talk about it a lot is to provide the um, technology support so that as your um, consumers and patients are walking through what they need, that they uh, have a phone call available to them if they need that. And so these are just some uh, statistics that um, really point to the fact that, you know, if you can get broadband and have it reach your patients, it really provides a positive impact in a couple of areas. So uh, provides them the physical um, availability to the broadband and the affordability uh, to the services and equipment. 
as well as the digital skill sets um, that are needed. And, and we're finding that the highest levels of poverty are still um, the lowest uh, broadband adoption. So we still have some work to do there. So let's talk a little bit about this digital literacy. And um, we like to think about it as building a house. And so if you put the foundation in, you'll be able to build the house and have a very strong and um, secure home. So if we look at what the foundation is here, that if you provide um, your consumers and patients with the opportunity and the access and competence, that then they can build their skills for digital literacy. So if you give them the opportunity, then they can build their skill sets around navigating and accessing the information to then be able to use it in a way um, to innovate <clears throat> and really to look at um, how they can problem solve. So, you know, if I have this issue, how can I resolve it? Um, as well as around safety and security. And if they have access to this information, then they can use it to understand it and create, you know, all the different um, things that they need to, as we were talking about, you know, whether it's a personalized plan for themselves or any of these other things that we have listed here. And then they become competent using that data. And that's really where we want to get them to so that then they have the skills to multitask with the data, to <coughs> excuse me, to understand the data that's coming in, flowing in and out for them. <clears throat> and then they have the tools and tech school, the tools and textual skills to um, use it. So then um, they're using this to really work on um, uh, simulation and decision making. <clears throat> Excuse me. It was it was um, interesting to note during COVID, consumers found the majority of their health information from the local and state news. It wasn't from their healthcare provider or their health organizations. So this is very important now for us, now that we're standing up our telehealth platforms and programs to make sure that our consumers and our patients understand the, the information that we give them so that they can use it um, appropriately to make the decisions that they need to. So what are some organizations doing? Um, you know, everybody's trying to do um, anything that they can to help remove some of these barriers. So some of our clients have connected patients with lifeline support so that they can help them lower their phone costs. Some of them have been very creative in taking telehealth to where the patient is. So whether it's at a community center, a library, or a shelter, but somewhere where the patients are so that they can um, access this information um, a little bit easier. Facilitating the digital literacy and skills, you know, I just talked about that and, you know, I can't um, tell you enough about that because we're seeing that as one of the latest uh, big issues with the digital divide. And some organizations are providing their patients with iPads or, IT or tablets at, that have a hotspot so that they can come, uh, that they will bring them the um, uh, device prior to their visit. And then after the, the visit, that device is returned to them. And then one of the things with, that we talk to our clients about all the time, and Diana is gonna get into this a little bit more is to, um, to continue to work with your states um, to develop the legislation for telehealth, whether it's around reimbursement or internet, internet access for all, because these are the two things that are um, that will continue to be barriers until we make sure that they are um, well within um, uh, the legislation to keep them moving. And one of the things to think about um, that I that's so true, especially in this age of consumerism that's happening to us in healthcare is that at some point, the people are gonna access the care how, when, and where they want and for the price they want, they're out shopping. So they're gonna get it from you or from someone else. So this is the time to take your shot and provide the information that they need 
and be there for them um, as the consumers are looking for an organization to be loyal to. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Diana so she can talk, talk to us a little bit more about Massachusetts League for Community Health Centers. Hello everyone, I'm Diana Arani, COO of Mass League of Community Health Centers. Prior to that, I was VP of Health Informatics. Um, so this is especially exciting for me to be here today. The Mass League is the trade association for community health centers. Community health centers are healthcare facilities that provide primary care and other services such as dental, behavioral care, pharmacy, optometry, and others with community engagement. Many have social services embedded in the health centers. The health centers treat all people regardless of their ability to pay or their insurance status. In Massachusetts, we represent 52 community health centers and 1 million patients. Our mission is to promote population health equity for all through leadership and programs, supporting community health centers and members in achieving their goals of accessible, quality, comprehensive, and community responsive health care. Quite a mouthful, but I think the center of the slide uh, sums it up the best. And these are our six areas of focus. Um, we are actually just about to enter our 50th anniversary year. So we have been around quite a, a while. And just as a um, interesting fun fact, the very first health center in the country started right here in Boston at Columbia Point. Next slide, please. So let's talk about defining health equity in the problem. According to the CDC, health equity is achieved when every person has the opportunity to attain his or her full health potential, and no one is disadvantaged from achieving this potential because of social position or other socially determined circumstances. Health inequities are reflected in differences in length of life, quality of life, rates of disease, disability, and death severity of disease and access to treatment. All of that is another way of saying that your zip code determines your life expectancy. Um, so let's talk a little bit about why that is. Um, there's been historical mistreatment of people of color by the medical establishment. There have been systemic, pol systemic policies such as segregated and underfunded medical facilities. And recently there is a study showing that um, black people are less likely to be treated for pain in the emergency room than white people are. And that the, the treatment was an under treatment of pain. And just to give you um, some idea going further back uh, as an example of why there's mistrust in the black community, Dr. Marion Sims, who's widely known as the father of gynecology, experimented on enslaved black women without anesthesia to perfect his surgical re repair techniques of fistulas. In his autobiography, he describes performing over 30 surgeries on a single enslaved woman. After perfecting the technique, he went on to perform these surgeries on anesthetized white women and ended up with a claim and a statue in, in Brooklyn, New York. Next slide, please. So looking at the social determinants of health, you can see in this infographic that it's about socioeconomic factors, physical environment, health behaviors, and health care. Um, so how do community health centers fit into all this? Well, community health centers have um, been collecting social determinants of health data for over 20 years as part of their federal funding. Most have been collecting significantly more than the required data elements to inform their delivery of care to their patients. The data has been used to advocate for social services such as access to housing, food banks, and to address safety issues. Next slide, please. So here you can see how Maslow's hierarchy of needs which we all remember from freshman year of college, um, is reflected in the everyday realities of the social determinants of health. Social determinants of health are captured in the EMR and in population health software. Additionally, 
um, Medicaid, which is called MassHealth, ACO requires several SDOH data points. It's great for analyzing issues that affect health equity. For example, people who identify as having food insecurity and a diabetes diagnosis can be targeted for prompt intervention. One of the things that we've started doing recently is using telemedicine to conduct these social determinants of health screenings. Next slide, please. The Social Determinants Accelerator Act, um, as you can see here in December, included $3 million to establish a social determinants of health pilot program. It, so social determinants of health is finally getting attention as there is an increased focus on health equity. Our national association, called the National Association of Community Health Centers, has been working on this issue for five years and has developed a standardized form to collect SDOH. It's called PREPARE, the protocol for responding to and assessing patients' assets, risk, and experiences. They worked with EMR vendors, and now they're included in fields in the EMR so you can capture all of these data elements. And pretty much all of the major EMRs have this now. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about this interesting collaboration called the FQHC Telehealth Consortium. So I wanna just level set a little bit to let you know what it looked like um, before the pandemic. So before the pandemic, Medicaid, uh, who most of our insurance is, is Medicaid in, in community health centers, um, did not reimburse telehealth visits for primary care. They did for behavioral health. Um, but it wasn't widely used. So um, health centers, very few of them had telehealth at all. Some had, did have them, but not a lot. So the pandemic came and you know, it unprecedented for everyone. All of a sudden, everyone had to shut down, at, at least initially, um, no one wanted to come in to, to the see people in person. Everyone was scared. Um, and the risks were unknown, and there was no vaccine at the time. So we joined forces with the Community Care Cooperative, which is an accountable care organization in Medicaid that is um, composed mostly or entirely of FQHCs. So we, it was a natural uh, meeting of the minds, and we quickly stood up this organization or this collaboration to get funding from private and public sources to be able to provide telehealth to 35 FQHCs serving more than 700,000 patients. So the services provided everything from hardware, software, IT, um, a design of a holistic telehealth roadmap platform, which is basically showing the health centers how to go from zero to HERO in terms of telehealth and be able to integrate it into their practice. Um, an FQHC telehealth playbook, which is available on the website, um, fqhctelehealth.org, I think it is, um, and a dashboard of performance indicators for the consortium so we know how we're doing at the health centers. And what's special about this is that we understand the social determinants and how they fold in to the healthcare, um, the telehealth consortium. So things that we're looking at that may be different for some patients than others is one, the cultural challenges around telehealth. So that includes maybe you live in a multifamily household or multi-generational household. So there's not a lot of privacy or maybe you are from a different country and it's very confusing to try and log into telehealth, especially through a patient portal um, of which we have pretty low adoption to the, to the language barriers. And it's, you know, even a good portal can be confusing for most of us. Um, also having to share your phone or your device with many family members. So, just because one person has a phone doesn't mean it's their phone. 
it could be a family phone or you know a group of people using the same phone. So these are the realities that we sought to address. Next slide, please. So initially uh, we did phase one, which was basically uh, to get everyone up and running and to provide devices, broadband and education to the patients and to integrate into primary care and behavioral health teams, the use of telehealth. Uh, people were very excited about this. The FQHC leaders um, were always looking to use telehealth as an important tool to promote health equity and reduce health disparities. Um, so we talk about four things that we were seeking to do. One is to bridge the digital divide. So that includes not only devices and technology, but also partnerships with trusted people in the community to lower the barriers to learning about how to use FQ, uh, how to use telehealth in it for FQHC patients um, and the education piece around the telehealth. So we commonly use community health workers or telehealth ambassadors who are people of the community who are educated in telehealth to go out into the community and help people set it up, get ready for their visit, um, and, and basically learn how to conduct and be on the other side of a telehealth visit. Um, and when I say telehealth, I'm including audio only as well. Audio only is a big part of our volume because um, a lot of Patients don't want you to see where they live. They don't want you to see if they're in an overcrowded condition or they may have no privacy and would rather take a phone call taking a walk than have to find a corner to try and, you know, have a telehealth visit in. So audio only is actually the majority of the visits that we do even today. We also wanted to address health disparities through telehealth. So we're going to identify, understand, and address disparities in patients' ability to access telehealth. And using that to identify things like food insecurity, housing instability, and more. Then we wanna build capacity in the health centers to ensure that it's sustainable and going into the future. In our phase two, which we've already started, we have something that we call elbow support for implementation, evaluation, and sustainability, which is basically a full-time um, performance improvement person at the health center solely focused on telehealth. And then we want to measure, evaluate, and disseminate our learnings um, with a telehealth playbook, with a website, and um, with sharing information amongst our peers in, in um, different forums. Next slide, please. We're also working with the government to affect change. Uh, for example, Michael Curry, who some of you may have seen um, recently on TV or heard on the radio, who's our president and CEO, has been involved with several levels of the Massachusetts government. As co-chair of the Health Equity Task Force of Massachusetts, um, he was working with a diverse and large group to provide the legislator, legislature with recommendations on how to improve health equity. Um, that report was issued two weeks ago, and it calls for a cabinet level position in state government for equity in general with a big focus on health equity. He's also a member of the Massachusetts Governor's Task Force for COVID-19 and co-founder of this consortium. Um, there is also recently a new call to action from many diverse leaders across our healthcare environment uh, just to focus on health equity. And telehealth is a great way to provide access to people with social determinants of health fa factors such as lack of access to transportation and or if you have childcare or elder care and the trip to the doctor is just um, too much to handle, that's where telehealth comes in. Telehealth is now reimbursable uh, thanks to the advocacy of our policy team. Behavioral health will remain um, reimbursable for eternity basically. And um, 
primary care will be reimbursable at least for the next two years, although I don't know how they could walk that back, um, especially because we're carefully uh, gathering data on the effectiveness of telehealth. Our, uh, next, we're going to work on licensing issues, because as you may know, you have to have a, a, the doctor or a nurse practitioner or PA has to have a license in the state where the patient is sitting. So given that we're in Massachusetts and we're surrounded by other states and we're not that big compared to other states, um, this, this can be a problem. That restriction was lifted as long as the uh, state of emergency was in place, but the state of emergency expired. So um, those regulations are now in full effect. So now we're going to see if there's a, a legislative uh, remedy to this or not. Thank you. So then, Diana, thanks. This has uh, been great. It's so it's always so exciting to hear what you're doing um, at the at the league. Um, always amazed by what's going on and and the involvement with uh, the government. So what's next? You know, the job's not done, and so we need to really address racism's impact on healthcare. And Diana's pointed out several different um, examples of that. And telemedicine is pointing the way for that. And then through its flexibility and low time commitment, what we're finding is that telehealth is, is giving fast uh, ways so that people can connect and access their care. So um, as you heard me say earlier with um, the consumers, they're looking for fast, quick, uh, low time commitment, easy to use. And so we're finding that telehealth is answering the needs for them for that. And then by expanding the access that we talked about, it really helps promote health equity so that everybody has access to the care that they need regardless of where they live. And, you know, we can't say it enough. And this is something that uh, Michael has said many different times is that we really have to maximize the access to, uh, to telemedicine. And it includes um, the following. This is um, something also that uh, Michael had said. Michael, as Diana said, is on the TV and in the news uh, all the time. And so um, it really has to focus around educating people in the underserved areas and help them understand what telehealth is and really working on the digital literacy piece of this and providing them with the tools that they need. So whether it's a tablet or a smartphone, or it's the remote uh, patient monitoring that a lot of um, organs, a lot of consumers are looking for now. Um, it's just so important. And it's just as important as the internet access um, to helping bridge that digital divide. So what do you need to take away with as um, Diane and I have given you many different things uh, to think about. So the first is you really need to think differently. So as there are different barriers and challenges there, you have to evaluate them so that you can um, really understand how to make uh, access and care compliance uh, more manageable during these challenging times and how you can remove the barriers. And you have to plan differently. So you need to look at how you can increase uh, the adoption of digital health and by doing so reduce the health disparities um, in the consumer's mind. So that's gonna be very important, uh, again, to look for um, seamlessness for the consumer because the goal is to get that consumer, have them engage with you, understand what you provide so that they can be a long-term partner with you and they have that stickiness that we're all looking for from the consumer. And then to act differently. So look to using these amazing telehealth tools to provide the services to the underserved and under-resourced communities. So these are three things that we'd like you to take away um, as you leave this session. So we have some questions going on. So how about if we 
um, see what. Would you like me to read them, Donna, or do yeah, you, why don't can you, you see the question? Yeah, would you like to? Yeah. We'll okay. Pull them up. Sure. So the first question is, um, it says, I want to ask, with the problem of, lo of disparities in accessibility to telehealth between wealthy to poor and low socioeconomic populations, how are you offering to do how are you offering to do a accessibility to telehealth, telehealth more equal for all? Well, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for asking it. So we're working on multiple fronts. So for example, we got a large government grant from the um, FCC uh, to provide equipment and broadband for people. So we bought a bunch of phones and tablets as well as um, remote patient monitoring devices such as blood pressure cuffs and glucometers. Um, and instead of just like handing them out to people, we work with people in the health center who meet with the patients. Usually these are community health workers, but there are other types of patient advocates that we work with because the, the, you know, the healthcare providers this is not, they don't have time to do that and mm -hmm. you need a lot of patience. Mm -hmm. So these ambassadors will do things such as setting up email for the first time for some people. They can download apps. They can explain to you in your own cultural um, lang language, basically how this works and when it works and why it works and whether or not you can trust it. So similar to the vaccine hesitancy that we're addressing also, using people from the community uh, seems to engender a lot of trust. Mm -hmm. And just as an aside, um, in order to be qualified as a federally qualified health center, your board must consist of 51% or greater patients and people from the community. Mm -hmm. So it is definitely a community run uh, organization and they will have the opportunity to ask people in the community what would help adopt telehealth, mm -hmm. um, especially with behavioral health, because that has the additional stigma attached to it. Mm -hmm. But it's a work in progress. Diana, that's a, a great answer. And that's a great area of some success and some lessons learned that you had. What else have you learned? Because you've been doing a lot of different things in the past year. So any other key lessons that you've learned along the way? Um, yes, there's a lot of different lessons we've learned along the way, especially for health equity. For example, um, people in the community often prefer uh, providers who look like them, have had their lived experiences and can understand the culture. So having telehealth provides better access to people because they can, you know, see a patient basically back to back, obviously with room built in for the notes, but um, it's not as dependent on people's uh, transportation needs. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's one example um, similarly, with behavioral health, uh, it can be more private. Some people are hesitant to get off the bus in front of a behavioral health facility or even go into a community health center and go to the uh, counseling section. Mm -hmm. but, but with telehealth, they're just taking a phone call like they would from anyone else and they could walk around the street or mm -hmm. any place else they feel comfortable and not have to worry about that extra added stigma, especially if it's within your own household. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Diana, there's a question and I'm gonna give it to you. Was the FCC grant only for Massachusetts or for other states? A national grant they gave out, oh, I can't even think of, there, was, there were three different iterations of it. Mm -hmm. It must be a total of well over $300 million. So it mm -hmm. was, national and um, most people that applied for it received it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and there's more, more out there now. So um, I know that a lot of organizations have applied for these different grants, the broadband grant and others. Um, yeah, because I think it's like you said, Diane, about 300 million that's out there right now and they're 
waiting to hear. No one's heard just yet. We've all been checking to see if, if they've heard. And Diana, there's another question. How have you made telehealth inclusive without any bias in your organization? Well, I won't say anything has no bias. <laughs> So everything has some bias. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea is to figure out, rather than tell people, like, this is how telehealth works. You have to log into the portal. You have to, you know, log in 20 minutes before, and ha you have to have a video camera. Yeah. Instead of telling people what they have to do, we ask them and figure out with them what works for you. It's going to vary among patients, it's going to vary among health centers, and it's going to vary among um, populations within a subcultural population. Mm -hmm. uh, so we work with people such as community health workers or patient navigators mm -hmm. or telehealth ambassadors. These are all names for people mm -hmm. of the community to, who work at the health center. Mm -hmm. who are hired by the health center specifically to figure out what would work. For some people, it, they would love a group visit for maternity discussions of maternal health. Other people would, would never want another person, you know, in a discussion with them. Mm -hmm. um, we also make sure we have translators available. Mm -hmm. uh, most people use a language line, and so you can have either audio only or a visual translator in pretty much any languages. Our, our health centers work with probably north of 60 different languages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so that's, um, that's really been helpful. And we've noticed with a lot of our clients too that um, they have hired and focused on marketing. Like you said, Diana, the marketing and the community community champions to really understand what's going on in the community and so how you can bring telehealth to them and what works for them. And it may work differently in a variety of different uh, places. So I apologize, I didn't mention everybody's name as they were asking the questions. So um, I apologize for that. And as new questions come in, I'll make sure to identify who the questions are coming from. So thank you. Uh, for pointing that out. Yeah, so yes. I'd like to thank uh, Shmuel Yerushalmi yes. for asking the first question. Yes. Thank you for that. <laughs> we appreciate that. So any other well, thank you. questions? Yeah, I was going to say, Donna, I don't have any other questions right now. If anyone else would like to put any questions in the Q&A, um, we do have a few more minutes. And um, while uh, we are waiting for any other questions, just to remind everyone, the CP Hymns credit will be sent to the registered attendee of today's session. And we would love to thank Diana and Donna for joining us today. And our next session is scheduled for August 24th, um, which seems like the summer is flying by by me saying that, um, which is titled Advantages of Digital Paper for Clinical Information Exchange. And the registration can be found on our New England Hymns website. So um, thank you, ladies, for joining us today and answering all the questions that we've had. And we appreciate your time. Great. Thank you. Good luck, everybody, in your journeys. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks. Have a good day.